Let's go to God's Word. Let's go to God's Word. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Today. Can I, anyone testify? Is it, is, it's been a great study in Ecclesiastes so far. It's a great book. Amen? It's a great book. I hope some of us feel that way. Um, every week it's kind of the same cycle for me. You know, Monday, I kind of look at the passage for the week and I'm like, oh. And then as the days go on, I'm like, oh. You know, it's like the same, same cycle every week. And that happened, of course, again this week as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. The message is titled, The Sacrifice of Fools. The Sacrifice of Fools. You can ask my kids, you can ask either Abby or Isaiah, and they'll confirm this. But I often tell them about the importance of our words. The importance of our words. On more than one occasion, I've shared one of my most important life mottos with them. And it speaks to the importance of choosing our words as carefully as possible. And the motto I tell them all the time is, even if you are stupid, sound like you are smart. Okay? And I tell them, kids, that's what your dad has tried to do my whole life. Even if you are stupid, sound like you know what you're talking about. Choose your words wisely. Okay? I can't tell you how much it's helped me as a preacher over the last 12 years. I'm sure most of you have figured out by now I'm not that intelligent, but I just try my best every week to put the right words together for us. And that's why I love preaching from the Word of God. You know, expository preaching. Because the Word of God speaks for itself, right? You don't need to add anything to what God's Word says. But in all seriousness, um, one of the principles in God's Word from the beginning to the, to the end of the Scriptures is the significance and power of words. In Genesis 1, God spoke the universe into existence, right? Let there be. Throughout the Old Testament, God raised up prophets to deliver His words to guide, to teach, to rebuke the children of Israel. In John chapter 1, fascinating here, John chapter 1, Apostle John began his great epistle, starting in verse 1. Here's what he said, and you, you guys know this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Apostle John, from the beginning of his epistle, or his, his, his gospel rather, refers to Jesus as the Word, the Logos of God, the Word. And every Sunday we, we study from the Word of God and believe that every single one of the more than 600,000 words in the original manuscripts of the canon of Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Every single one of them inspired by the Holy Spirit. The bottom line, words matter. Words matter. In our passage today, we can appreciate King Solomon's wisdom regarding this as well. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll uh, go into the passage together. But let's go ahead and pray one more time. Lord, as we come before your word today, as we study this very important passage, help us to capture the significance of what your word says. Make it Make it cause our hearts and our minds to seek greater wisdom and discernment in what we say. And through that, I pray that we would be more faithful as witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So open our hearts to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise together. Let's read from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Just read along with me in your hearts. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God, and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. 
for they do not know they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin. And do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness. Rather, Fear God. Let the church say, Amen. All right, let's be seated together. Can you guys in the back hear me okay? Is it okay? All right. So here King Solomon was giving his readers a very strong warning regarding the practice of making vows to the Lord, which was a common practice for the ancient Israelites. I'm sure some of you can remember in the Old Testament some examples of vows, important vows that were given unto the Lord. One of them that stands out is Hannah's vow. Hannah's vow. She was not able to conceive children. And she prayed and asked God, Lord, if you give me a child, I will dedicate. If you give me a son in particular, I will dedicate him to you for all his life. She made this vow to God and God answered her prayer and gave her a son who we all know as Samuel. And she did, in fact, follow through on her vow. But in contrast to that, King Solomon was writing about vows that were not kept, calling these the sacrifice of fools, which included hasty or impulsive speech, repetitive or unnecessarily wordy proclamations, kind of reminds you of Jesus' rebuke of the Pharisees. Right? They would have all these repetitive, long, wordy prayers that they would give in public. Empty promises made before God. Now these are bad enough on their own, but even worse, when done within the temple of God and the sacredness of worship. Now both ancient and modern Jewish readers of Ecclesiastes 5 would understand why he put so much weight on this. You know, the Talmud, which is the central text of Judaism that contains you know, the oral traditions and interpretations of Old Testament texts, calls for, get this, the death of your children if you make a vow before the Lord that you don't keep. Yikes! And I feel bad for the kids. It's like, what did I do? Like, my dad's the one who didn't fulfill his vow, right? That's pretty... That's a pretty serious consequence for not fulfilling your vows. You know, children, the kids, uh, choose your parents wisely. You know? I'm just, I'm just kidding. But, but yeah, that, that's what they, now the Talmud is not scripture. Okay? This, is the, <laughs> this is the document of Judaism. But just to give you a sense of their understanding of the holiness of God. And Judaism as a whole, it has a good theology of the holiness of God that we can learn from as, as Christians, right? Something we can appreciate, right? So there was these severe consequences for not telling the truth, especially before God. Now, we can, we can understand and appreciate that, right? Even in our modern context. You know, you, you would be very, very careful to choose your words in front of a judge in a court of law. Right? You, you would not lie. I don't think you would. Most of us would be really careful to speak the truth before a judge in a court. Because we know that if we lie, that we could be thrown into prison. Right? There is, there's this real sense of fear we have before a judge. And yet, a judge is still a human being at the end of the day. And at the most... He or she could just give us a physical punishment of imprisonment or something like that. How much more vital 
is it to tell the truth before Almighty God who has the authority and power of the eternal life and death of our souls in his hands? And we should understand that in our modern day, we have you know, written or digital contracts and laws that legally bind our agreements. Such as the case every time, which I don't know why these days you have to do this like for almost anything. You click the I accept, right? Whenever you're opening an app or looking at a particular website, you have to click that I accept, right? That's basically a, a, a binding kind of like legal thing they have to do, right? So we, we have those, you know, we, we always want things in writing or in digital signatures or whatnot. We all do that. We, we deal with that every day. But in ancient times, agreements were not like that, of course. They didn't have that technology. So their agreements were oral, verbal. They would promise things to each other through their word. And in order to make their word seem reliable, what would they do? They would swear, if you will, or make their oath in the name of God. Now, some people still do that. That's what they would do in order to say, what I'm promising, what I'm going to do, I'm being real to my word, right? It's like the good old days when the deal was sealed with a handshake, you know? That's kind of how it was. They had to just make agreements through their word. So it was critical to that whole system of society that everyone was, was as truthful as they could possibly be, that they would fulfill what they promised to one another. And that much more, King Solomon is saying, when you make an oath or a vow to God, do not delay in keeping it. How important that is. And that goes right back again. So we appreciate kind of the, why this is so important. It goes back to the Mosaic Law. Moses made this clear to the Israelites very early on in Numbers chapter 30. Verses 1 and 2, it says, Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the sons of Israel, saying, This is the word which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So this was part of the Mosaic law. It was a command to be taken very seriously. In fact, this is even in one of the Ten Commandments. This is in the Third Commandment. You all know what this is. The Third Commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now the root issue of this commandment is not just about profanity. We've all kind of grown up learning that the third commandment is, you know, don't, don't say a bad word with God's name attached to it. Right? That's kind of how we all learn the third commandment. But in reality, the root of this third commandment is in the swearing of oaths. Right? So, in other words, God's saying, do not use my name lightly in making an oath to each other. If you're going to use my name, Fulfill your vow. My name is holy. Right? That's really at the heart of it. We hear people say all the time, I swear to God, quote unquote, about something. As a way of trying to convey their, their sincerity or truthfulness. But again, in the ancient context, this notion of invoking God's own name to our vows could lead to harsh judgment if not done honestly. This is why King Solomon was so strong on this. This is why he made this such a big deal. Called any flippant attitude toward making vows to God, he called those an act of evil. An act of evil. To make a vow before God that, that you do not intend to keep or that you do not fulfill, he calls that evil. And how ironic that King Solomon would reference empty vows as evil. Because what did our Lord Jesus refer to?
to Satan as, to the devil as the father of. He's the father of what? He's the father of lies, right? He's the father of lies. When you lie, you're speaking his native language. When you lie, you're, you're right along the lines of pleasing the devil himself. Empty promises are lies that the devil himself loves to hear. King Solomon called those empty promises acts of evil. Jesus, in the same way, calls any lie an act of the devil, essentially, because he's the father of lies. But in contrast to this, then, in contrast to the sacrifice of fools, King Solomon points out a couple of important things. Two important principles. When it comes to having a heart of, of reverence, fear, proper fear of God. The first one is simple. Let your words be few. You need to say that to the person next to you. And some of you will really enjoy saying this to the person next to you. Let your words be few. Let your words be few. Yeah, I see some of you really enjoying that. <laughs> Let your words be few. Boy, we are living in a time when people have so much to say. Don't we? The church is no exception. I mean, we see this every day. The world of media is insanity. We are bombarded every minute by interview after interview of so-called experts or celebrities sharing their opinions on every matter under the sun. And on a more personal level, we see the same thing happen in the world of social media as well, amongst our peers and our friends. Everyone's so eager to share their thoughts, their opinions, and secretly hope that their posts will get a lot of likes, and a lot of shares, and a lot of positive responses and when it comes to our worship, and even within the relationships we share as brothers and sisters in Christ, we would be wise to let our words be few. Mind you, the principle here is not to say nothing at all. That's not what Scripture says. And a lot of us default to that, but that's just as disobedient to the text as talking too much. Right? He says, let your words be few. Let them count. The bottom line, let your words count. Say what needs to be said, when it needs to be said, and nothing more, nothing less. You know, one of my favorite Proverbs, where words are many, sin is not absent. That's such a good proverb, and I have to remind myself over and over again of that, because I have to talk a lot. <laughs> where words are many, sin is not absent. It's so true. Let your words count. Apostle James, I think he was a really big fan of the book of Ecclesiastes. Because if you read the epistle of James, there's so many principles there that come directly out of Ecclesiastes. It's really interesting. He wrote this in verse 26 of his first chapter, James chapter 1. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues to see themselves. And their religion is worthless. Wow. I mean, that's, he's not pulling any punches there. Those who constantly feel the need to speak and are overly verbose are only deceiving themselves into thinking their many words are a sign of spiritual maturity. When in actuality, that is a sign of spiritual immaturity. In fact, Apostle James was unapologetic in declaring that if you talk too much, your religion is worthless. Yikes. Man, what a rebuke that is. It's a healthy one, though. Especially if you talk a lot, right? He says, if you talk too much, your faith is worthless. Wow. Words matter. Words matter. 
So it's wise that we use discernment in our words. And as King Solomon wrote, draw near to, to listen when we come before the house of God. In the same way Apostle James declared earlier in chapter 1, be quick to listen. Quick to listen and slow to speak. Quick to listen and slow to speak. For those of you who are married in this room, if you keep that principle in your hearts, it will radically transform your marriage in a good way. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Human nature is exactly the opposite, isn't it? Right? Quick to listen, slow to speak. And you know, this, to kind of extracting this out a little bit to the life of the church, I think that encourages us to use greater discernment in the songs we sing. Amen? The songs we sing. Amen, worship leaders, right? Amen? And the songs we sing to the Lord in worship. How central it is that the words we declare to God in worship are actually true about Him. I mean, I no one's ever sang, sung a love song to me before, so I don't know what this is like. But I can imagine if someone were to sing you a love song about you, a song they wrote for you, and the song has nothing to do with you, it's kind of weird, right? When we're worshiping God, to how central it is that we sing songs that actually declare who He is. And I say that because there are songs out there that literally could be sung to anyone. And we're talking about songs that are accepted as like worship songs. They can literally be sung to anyone and declare literally nothing about God. It's just, it's mind-blowing that that's the case. And there's also a lot of songs out there that declare far more about what we're going to do for God than what God has done for us. Now, for those of you who grew up in my era, and, you know, went to a lot of youth retreats, you know, I love the song History Maker by Delirious, right? It's such a great, cool, fun song to play like the last night of the retreat. But this song has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It has everything to do with what I'm going to be. Okay? And it's like, I just, I, this is, it's a cool song. But if you really break down the lyrics, it's like, yikes. Yeah. That's not God-centered. Yeah. We should be careful what we sing. We should worship in spirit and truth. There's an old country saying about country music. Three chords of the truth. I like that. That should be worship. Three chords in the truth. Amen? We gotta worship God for who He really is. Worship Jesus for what He's really done. Now, that's not to say that if our lyrics are sound, that our worship is perfect. That's not what I'm saying. Right? Even if their lyrics are, are sound, theologically sound, biblically sound, doesn't mean that our worship is, is holy. You know, our worship is broken. Our worship is imperfect. Our worship is unholy because it's coming out of our, the remnant of our sinful nature still, right? Where our, our righteousness is still like filthy rags in comparison to God's holiness, right? Even our good lyrics are like filthy rags in comparison to God's holiness. But in our love and adoration for Him, in our desire to honor Him, it's a worthy effort that we choose our songs wisely and we sing songs that really declare who God is, really declare what Jesus has done, because that's what worship is. May our worship be truly worship and not just sentimentality, not just a nice riff of G, E minor, C, and D and getting us moved, and then there's no substance, right? Let's give God the worship as best as we can that He deserves. And another area that this brings up for me is the a need for discernment in us giving and receiving of the prophetic. People are as eager as ever to claim to have messages from God these days. And if you don't believe me, just go on YouTube. There are a lot of people claiming to be prophets on YouTube and post a lot of things. And while God will certainly speak through His people, we need to listen with discernment 
Because not everyone who claims to have a word from God really has a word from God. That's just the truth of the matter. And I'll be the first to admit my own failures in the giving and even in the receiving of the prophetic. Even if you have good intentions, and you can get it wrong. Okay, so this is, a, this is something that we need to really look at and take seriously in the church. We should listen to prophetic utterances with humility and discernment. Hold on to what is good and let go of all that is not. That's straight out of 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 through 22. Don't despise prophetic utterances. Hold on to what is good, let go of what is not. Listen with discernment. And here's what's interesting to me. When I look back on my, my life, when I look back on my relationship with God, there are moments in my life where people have shared prophetic words with me that deep, deeply encouraged me. Okay, they, they really did. But equally as much, if not even more often, what usually stuck with me are words that people who love God but don't claim to be prophetic, uh, didn't claim that what they were saying was prophetic. It was just a course of a conversation we'd have. That those that's those words, there are words that I've heard in those conversations that have been as prophetic to me as, as anything else I've heard. They stuck with me. Things that, that I've always appreciated. Like my, my youth group teacher in seventh grade saying, Peter, you should learn how to play guitar. Okay. Brother and sister, I don't think I would be even here in L.A. I would have never moved to the West Coast if I never learned how to play guitar. I can't tell you, like, there's a whole background story to that, of course, but how prophetic that was. And all that person was doing is just, just chatting. Right? That word of encouragement changed my life, literally. It shaped my entire future. It's crazy. Another one is the time I met uh, a pastor, a local pastor that I have tremendous respect for, telling me early in my ministry, don't worry about growing the church, just honor God's word. Now, I can promise you he wasn't claiming to be prophetic, if you know anything about this particular pastor. But those words were never forgot those words. Shaped my whole ministry. I could share a lot of examples, but the moral of the story is every single one of you may have said something powerful to someone without even realizing it. You don't have to claim to be prophetic. Just walk with Jesus. Study his word. Be faithful every day in the little things. Just walk with him. And you might say something that will transform someone's life. So all the more, be careful what you say. <laughs> right, brothers and sisters? But I want to encourage you that our words are powerful without you even realizing it. Right? It's really, really amazing. All right, let's close with this. Also notice this in verses 4 and 5. We go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. King Solomon implored anyone who makes a vow before the Lord, be sure to keep it. Okay, keep your vow before God. It would be better not to make a vow at all than to make one and not keep it. And this is right in line with what our Lord Jesus taught as well. Matthew 5, starting in verse 33, Jesus said this. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. Wow, that really echoes what King Solomon said, doesn't it? Keep in mind here, Jesus was not making the point that in 
making an oath in, at all was a sin. Rather, he was making the point that we will not need to make oaths. We will not need to implore the name of God to each other if our speech is straightforward and honest. In other words, no need to swear to God about anything if you simply spoke the truth. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no, nothing more, nothing less. To feel the need to say more is evil, Jesus said. King Solomon said the same thing. Man, words matter. Words are not cheap. Words matter. So God is honored by honesty and integrity in our words, in our promises to him and to others. We need to understand how important this is to God. Why does God care so much about our speech? Why does he care so much about our words? Because he is a God who is true to his word. And if we are going to be faithful witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ to represent the heart of God, then let your yes be yes and let your no be no. He is the God of the covenant. He's the God who's true to his promises. Every promise in his word, he will keep. He cares about his words to us and he cares deeply about our words to one another and our words to him. All his promises are yes and amen in Christ, the word says. He's always faithful and true to his promises. And that's why he cares for what we say. Let's turn to Apostle James one last time. Apostle James said this, James chapter 5, verse 12, along these same lines. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let but your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Okay, so what I just read sounds to you guys like, oh, isn't that exactly what Jesus just said? And say, yes, absolutely, that's exactly what Jesus just said. But what are the first three words of that verse? In James chapter 5, verse 12, what does it say? Let's say it together. What are the first three words? But above all. Can we say that again? But above all. Why is that important? Apostle James is saying, of all the things I wrote in my epistle, of everything I wrote, faith without works is dead, don't show favoritism, all the things he talks about, of everything he wrote, he said, but above all these things, but above all these things, be careful what you say. Did you hear that? That's a huge statement. How important it is that we speak truthfully. Let your words be few, and let your words count, and let those words be true. Oh, that rhymes. Let your words be few, and let your words be true. It's pretty good. Something easy for us to remember, and important for us to remember. It's a powerful reminder for us today of the holiness of God and the grace of God. He's so utterly holy, if we really think about it, how unworthy our words are of Him all the time. How unworthy our worship is of Him. I mean, he is so holy that all the things we say, it's like but rags before his, his sight. It, he's just so holy. How guilty are we of the many empty promises we've made before God that have not kept? How, how unholy our prayers so often have been, so self-serving, so self-centered. He's so holy, if we can just wrap our minds around how unworthy our words are of Him, and yet at the same time, how gracious He is that even in those imperfect psalms, and even in those selfish prayers, and even in those promises that we failed to, to keep, that He still received them, and receives them. That He covers them by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So he is holy. And we need to be re reminded of that in all we say before him and before each other. And at the same time, we can thank him that he's so gracious with us. And with those two realities in mind, let us obey God's word by seeking greater discernment and wisdom in our words. That they may be few, but spirit-led. That they may honor him rightly. That we may have integrity, humility, and truth uttered from our lips. It's not a bad thing for us to take a step back and choose our words as wisely as we can in order to honor God and one another. Let's come before him in prayer. Father, we, we do dedicate our, our lives to you. Lord, we dedicate our words to you. Father, we will never be perfectly faithful to you. But help us, God, to be as faithful as we can be by the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the vows we make or simply not make them at all. And to be faithful in what we say to one another to edify others. Help our words to edify your church. Help our words to speak life into dead places. Help our words bring light into darkness. Help our words matter, God. Give us wisdom, discernment, Holy Spirit, that our, that our mouth, our lips, may be an instrument of righteousness, an instrument that brings you glory and honor. Thank you, Lord, for the warning we received in your word, for the truth we received in your word, may we take it to heart, God, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our families, in our parenting. May we take it to heart, God, in every part of our lives. Holy Spirit, we consecrate our lips to you, our words to you. Be glorified. Rise together. Let's close with this song.